and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, we're going to tackle excitation, contraction, coupling. Of course, we're going to do it Penguin Prof style. You know what comes next? Take a second, click those buttons. It makes a big difference. Thanks. I am assuming some knowledge here. I'm assuming some signal transduction. Uh, some knowledge about the action potential and understanding why ions want to move in the direction that they do. And of course, I'll put those links down below. We're going to look at excitation contraction coupling. What the heck is it? It's the coupling of an electrical stimulus, usually an action potential, with a mechanical response, which is a muscle cell contraction. So the goal of the video is to really get at how are these connected. And it really is a cool story. I am going to show some images and actually we're going to review just a little bit about the sliding filament theory. This material comes from OpenStax College. This material is all free. You can download free textbooks from OpenStax and in fact their grant money comes from student downloads and faculty adoption. So please go check them out. Now we're going to look at a close-up of a somatic motor neuron and how it connects with a skeletal muscle cell. And we're gonna blow up this region here and we see the motor end plate, which is an infolding of the skeletal muscle cell membrane. Now here is the cartoon that I've made to show excitation contraction coupling. So here we have the somatic motor neuron and you see vesicles containing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Now, everything else in the drawing is skeletal muscle. Let's look at all the little parts here. We've got some nicotinic receptors, which are cholinergic, right? They receive the ligand acetylcholine. And the motor end plate is the region of the cell membrane that is thrown into folds to increase surface area. We've got some other familiar players here, the three sodium, two potassium pump, which maintains the gradients for sodium and potassium. As well as this guy, calcium ATPase, it's also called the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, or CIRCA for short. It's important because it maintains a very strong calcium gradient from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the cytosol. In other words, this pump is going constantly to maintain that gradient. And you will see in just a few minutes why that gradient is so important. Now in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we've got all of this calcium stored up. And the other infolding that you see, this is a bigger infolding of the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. We call this the transverse tubule or T-tubule for short. And in the T-tubule, we have the magical protein. This is a dihydropyridine receptor, or DHP for short, and it has a really cool structural feature. It reaches out with its foot process and interacts with a receptor on the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane called the ryanodine receptor. This is the RYR1 isoform. That's the one that's found in skeletal muscle. There are others, uh, most notably the isoform number two that you find in cardiac muscle. Now, this is going to be the key, and we're going to see how a change in shape of the DHP receptor is going to lead to the opening of this ryanodine receptor, and it is just so cool. I think it's worth a second just to look at what this stuff actually looks like, and I like this view because you can see this connection between the T-tubules and here they call it a calcium release channel. That's the ryanodine receptor. And you can see the enlargement of the end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is often referred to as the terminal cisterni. And uh, it's neat to see what that actually looks like. But back to the cartoon, because it's a lot easier to see, this is what the muscle cell looks like at rest. When that somatic motor neuron fires, it releases acetylcholine into the synapse. And then two ligands are required for nicotinic receptors to open. So two molecules of acetylcholine bind to these nicotinic receptors, and then they will change shape and they open channels for sodium and potassium. So sodium will flood in, potassium will sort of leak out. This is mainly an issue of driving force. So you should know that sodium's driving force to come in far outweighs potassium's driving force for efflux. And if that is confusing to you, check out that video right there. 
So the cell becomes depolarized, and this depolarization spreads across the membrane and down the T-tubule. So here we are looking at the depolarization going down the T-tubule, and now it reaches the DHP receptor. The DHP receptor is voltage regulated, so it changes shape when the voltage changes. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here it is. So as the voltage changes, the DHP changes shape, and those foot processes pull open that RYR channel. This is the key, guys. You want to pay attention to this because this is the connection between a change in voltage and the release of calcium from a sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane, which is itself separate from the cell membrane other than this. So this, in a way, you can think of as a connection because ultimately the calcium has to be released from the SR, but this membrane doesn't depolarize. It's not connected to the plasma membrane in any way, but this protein depolarizes. And because of that, it mechanically opens this ryanidine channel, and that is the connection. So that really is the key to the whole thing. Now, once that ranadine channel opens, calcium diffuses out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and floods into the cytosol. Most physiology textbooks don't tell you this, but you know, Penguin Prof, you expect a little bit more. It's not really just diffusion. There's a really important protein in the SR called calciquestrin, which acts as a big buffer for calcium. So 18 to 50 ions of calcium can bind onto this thing. So it really is more than just diffusion, which accounts for the amazing ability of the SR to hold and then release calcium fast enough for all of this to work. Okay, so calcium then floods out into the cytoplasm and muscle contraction can begin. And I wanna show you how that works. So what happens is that calcium binds to the regulatory protein troponin and that causes a shape change. So troponin then slides tropomyosin off the binding sites, exposing the binding sites on actin so that myosin can bind to it. Now myosin has an ADP and a phosphate from the previous cycle still attached, and now it's going to lose them and it will then flex at that uppermost hinge point, and that is actually how you get the power stroke. So it pulls the thin filament towards the center of the sarcomere. Now we have the binding of another molecule of ATP, and that is going to cause myosin to detach from actin. And finally, the hydrolysis of ATP back to ADP and that inorganic phosphate powers the movement of the myosin head back into its high energy conformation. So that is the role of calcium in the story. Calcium is what initiates contraction. And as long as calcium is available to bind to troponin, you're gonna keep getting muscle cell contraction. Okay, so here's what we've seen. Excitation contraction coupling couples motor neuron action potential with muscle cell depolarization and subsequent contraction. This really happens because that DHP receptor is voltage regulated. And when it changes shape, it pulls across the cytoplasm over to the SR and pulls that ryanodine receptor open, and that allows calcium to be released from the SR. Once that happens, calcium binds to troponin, which changes the shape of the troponin-tropomyosin complex, and that is what allows myosin to bind to actin. Once the motor neuron stops firing, of course, the muscle cell repolarizes, everything goes back to rest, and it's all over as is this video. And as always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your love. Click those buttons. You know the drill. Join me on Facebook. Follow on Twitter. Good luck.